G'day, I'm Darren from Paranormal Hunters, and this video will be part of a series that I'm going to be doing on Aussie ghost stories. Today, we are going to delve into the creepy and true story of Fisher's ghost. Although the original events happened over 200 years ago, what happened to Frederick Fisher, the people associated with the murder, and its aftermath are still being told today. So let's get into this strange and sordid story. Frederick Fisher was born in London in 1792. He was sent to Australia as a convict on board the Atlas III with 186 other males and that was in July of 1816 at just the age of 23 and by 1822 he was already a ticket of leave convict with a number of farms under his name including one that was southwest of Sydney in a small convict settlement named Campbelltown. Fisher's new life was somewhat of a convict success story until he turned to speculative building in Campbelltown, where things started to take a turn for the worse. During a dispute with William Booker, who had built the horse and jockey in for him, Fisher stabbed Booker, though not too seriously. Expecting a long imprisonment, though, Fisher gave power of attorney to William George Worrell, another ticket of lever who owned a neighbouring farm. But luckily for Fisher, he escaped with only a light sentence. He returned to Campbelltown and moved in with Worrell until June of 1826 when he suddenly and quite unexpectedly vanished. Actually in my travels of researching this story I found that the Horse and Jockey Inn has its own stories and paranormal happenings that could easily do another episode just on that alone. So stay tuned, I think I might look into that one. So when people had started to question Fisher's whereabouts, they hadn't seen him for a few weeks, Worrell stood up and said that he's probably just headed back to England. The authorities didn't accept this, as even though Fisher was a ticket of leave convict, by law he still was a convict and would be taking a huge risk of being arrested and handed even in a harsher sentence when entering England. This is where the tale of Frederick Fisher's disappearance takes an unusual turn. After four months without a trace from Fisher, late one evening, a local and highly respected gentleman, John Farley, was said to be heading home from a night drinking at the Patrick's Inn when he stumbled upon a strange figure sitting on the railing of a nearby bridge. The person seemed to be gesturing for him to come closer. As Farley approached, the hair on his arms stood up as he had realised that this wasn't any stranger, but this was the ghost of Frederick Fisher. Trying to compose himself, he noted that the spirit had moved one of his hands and was now pointing to a nearby farm. That farm was none other than William George Worrells. Things are starting to add up. Things are starting to point to one person, I think. It's all looking quite ominous for Mr. Worrell. But let's get into the story and see what else happens. When Farley looked back at the rail, the ghostly apparition was gone. Now, I'm guessing at this point, he's probably run as fast as he could back to the Patrick's Inn to tell everyone what he's just seen. And I'm pretty sure he would have downed quite a few ales straight afterwards just to calm those nerves. Now, initially, Farley's tale of seeing Fisher's ghost was dismissed, but the circumstances surrounding his disappearance eventually led to the police to search that paddock to which the ghost had supposedly pointed. It wasn't long, though, before they found the remains of the murdered fisher, buried by the side of a creek on the land of the one and only Mr. Worrell. 
Now, George Worrell was soon arrested for the crime of murder, though his stories originally blamed three farm workers that worked on his land, realising that he's not getting out of this. He soon confessed and then was subsequently hanged in February of 1827 for the murder of Frederick Fisher. Now, there have been no recorded sightings of Frederick Fisher's ghost other than that fateful night. Maybe he was finally at peace, that his remains would now be found and he could move on. Frederick Fisher was buried in the cemetery at St. Peter's Anglican Church in Campbelltown, aged just 33. Now, the story of Fisher's murder, subsequent strange events that led to the discovery of his body, had found itself over the other side of the world with publications in many English newspapers that started spreading the news by 1830. And today it's still being celebrated with a 10-day event in Campbelltown, New South Wales, held every November for Fisher's Ghost. Now, my research led me to some important information and some well-researched information on this story. The title of this was Call cool Not Tomorrow Thine the story of Frederick Fisher. And now this was a manuscript by J.W. Downing. A paragraph I thought very fitting was this, but where Fisher's untimely death was ever discussed, a ghost joined in, insisting on being noticed and being given its due share of significance. And since ghosts are not, and it seems never can be, legal entities, even if there were facts, they have to be sought outside official history. It is to a non-legal realm that quest for the supposed ghost must be pursued. Now I want to thank you very much for watching this video. This is just going to be the start, like I said, of a Aussie ghost stories. It'll be through from our beginnings, our convict heritage right through to today. I hope to bring you a lot more of these stories in the near future. Thank you and happy hunting.